It's time for us to get a Kidnet's opinion on Subaru's new contract with Spirit Beatrice. And that's right. The implication here now is that Subaru is also a Spirit Art user who has a contract with a great spirit. Not on Puck tier, but like Subaru, bro. Like, what kind of new power is he going to have? I should have noticed that. This <laughs> a kid that gave birth to this many babies. I, I didn't even realize that line. Ladies and gentlemen, she the really conclusion of this arc has officially come, as did I multiple times while watching this episode. What we just saw was the culmination of two entire seasons spent building up a character. Ever since the moment Beatrice was introduced, I just wanted her to be happy. Every scene always left me feeling bad for her, but finally this episode officially ended her 400 year losing streak. From that is crazy that from season one, Bieko has been just set up like this to be saved by Subaru. But it's kind of the other way around, right? Bieko is the one saving Subaru is at least how that conversation went at the end. Now on, Beatrice will never be lonely again because she just became Subaru's contract spirit. And Unless he dies and then we see like in trial two, right? Of all the different fucking timelines. Remember? Like, imagine how more depressing all those different future timelines that never actually existed but kind of would exist if Subaru died and it continued, how Biko would be so sad. And unlike Puck, she isn't buying milk anytime soon. Of <laughs> course, there's always the possibility that Subaru might die. However, with Beatrice at his side, I'd say he's got about a 99.9% .9 repeating, of course, chance of survival. This was the episode where real men cried. Thankfully, I had my tissues ready. I'm sorry, bro. Is he just a pussy? Or am I just a fucking sociopath? I think I'm just a sociopath. I think that these are probably normal reasons for a person to cry while getting like emotional scenes. I... I feel nothing. I feel a lot of things, but the last thing I'm feeling is crying. Like I see a, a monumental moment, it's Triumph and Biko is crying, Subaru is saving her. But there is no inclination for me to cry. Because, I don't know, just, that's just who I am. You experience enough fucked up shit in your life and you just become so hardened to the point where it's just difficult for you to cry. Only time I cry for ReZero, and that's, honestly, I hardly ever cry for animes. Unless it's like a very specific scene that like relates to my past. But even in ReZero, it made me cry twice. One was episode 7 in season 1. And then the other one was episode 23. That wasn't really crying. It was more like my eyes are getting watery because of the heroic tragedy. But I don't know. It's just... I don't feel it, bro. Because I am the perfect human of the white room. And this time, they weren't for Elsa. But speaking of Elsa, this episode had some massive Tomazaki-sized cut, cut content. That's right, Elsa was a zombie, crawling on the ground. In the light novel, Elsa survived last episode, and was supposed to die this episode. When Beatrice teleported Subaru out of the library, he got attacked by Elsa's living corpse. Mm -hmm. Her legs were destroyed, so she crawled around like a zombie from Black Ops. What happened next was about the same as we saw in the episode, except Elsa was supposed to be chasing after- There was also Guilty Low. That showed up too. Guilty Low wasn't just dead yet after Petra and Otto. For Subaru until finally she burns to death after he shuts the door on her. I don't normally complain about cut content. I just feel like Elsa deserved a better death than being flattened by a decapitated hippo. <laughs> so what? You want her to just face an explosion by a draft backdraft effect while her legs are already crushed? I don't know. Either way, it wouldn't have been good. But it is crazy that a hippo just like landed on her. But the cool thing about the hippo ending in the source material, right? Because in the, in, in the anime, the hippo did not get its belly cut. The belly was like its weak point. And Garfield just twisted the head off and threw the hippo onto Elsa. In the source material, the belly was the weak point, And Garfield scratched up the belly. And then the bowel hunter got defeated by the injured belly of the hippo. You know what I'm trying to say? There's, there's some sort of like connection there between the bowel hunter and the hippo's weak point and her dying by the hippo. It, yeah, it is pretty ironic, but I would have loved to see the zombie side. That would have been cool. But at least we can finally say Elsa is flat. The mansion burning to the ground was breathtaking to look at, although symbolically it represents the permanent progress our characters have made. And Bro, 
We're homeless! Where the fuck are we gonna stay in season three? Bro, Priscilla gonna make fun of us even more. Oh, you fucking halfwit. You homeless now, poor piece of shit. Our characters have made. In Amelia's case, her vulnerability is gone forever. And the pathetic, fragile character she used to be burnt away with the mansion. That's why it was so satisfying to watch her scolding Roswell. His pitiful condition was very reminiscent of the old Amelia from earlier this season. True, the lips all cracked and dried up and it felt like Subaru was to talk when talking to Roswell there. Amelia talking like Subaru. So that scene almost felt like Amelia not only disciplined Roswell, but also rectified her past self. Her character's development has reached incredible heights, and mm -hmm. I'm so proud of how far she's come. If it's it's unreal how much change Amelia has from the beginning of season two until now, right? This season we've seen Amelia at rock bottom, and we're also seeing her at this this peak of Amelia that we've ever seen, and I'm sure it, she hasn't even peaked. She just continues to get better and better. If we remember that Amelia wants demi-humans to be treated as equals, she took a big step in the right direction by liberating the sanctuary and granting the demi-human residents the freedom to merge with the outside world. Or merge? <laughs> or you mean discriminated against upon? Now, <laughs> Amelia has basically shattered the one safe space that exists for the demi-humans, and now people are going to be racist towards them. Or should I say cultural cross-pollination? But unfortunately, the Blizzard made it too dangerous for anyone to actually leave the sanctuary, so okay. as usual, Blizzard ruined everything. Thing. I want wah, to wah. applaud Roswell's voice actor for his amazing performance. I know this episode's highlight was obviously Beatrice, but don't sleep on Ro Roswell. has some great moments. His emotional voice acting there. Usually he just has his clown pronunciation like Hector, right? It sounds like he's just jesting and jeering you on, but it felt like there was like true emotional vulnerability. Roswell. Yep, now both maids are asleep. I want to point out that Roswell has reverted to using the pronoun Boku, which as you probably know is only used by younger men, which highlights how little Roswell has actually grown despite him being 400 years old. Basically, yeah, his mental maturity, I guess, is quote-unquote the still same as Roswell A. Mathers, because ever since then, right, time stopped for him. He's only been listening to the book. He has no growth. He doesn't know how to make his own decisions. And now he has to move forward. I thought it was obvious that Roswell took orders from the gospel because he wanted to reunite with Echidna. I mean, who wouldn't? But some of you in the last video's comment section were confused about his objective, so... It yeah, it is a bit more confusing because I thought that he wanted to kill the dragon. He's already said that because the dragon is the one that put the seal and echidna in this graveyard and if you kill the dragon through ram maybe and that's why ram and super are, are two of the most important hopes that roswell has right then he can free echidna and then what i don't know he also states that like ram should be the one to bury him implying that after you free echidna is there no more purpose to you you don't want to live like forever with her what is your what is the end goal if I were to put it simply, Roswell's goal is to get witch or die trying. Thus, he secretly activated his weather magic before the fight with Rom and Puck, but had to keep the spell active even during the fight, which left him vulnerable enough for Puck to overpower him. And That's right. Sixfold magic was not shown. Only fifthfold ma five fold ma five fold magic. And without his gospel, Roswell was completely lost. What he felt was a mix of desperation, anguish, and confusion. With nowhere left to turn, he could only pray that Rom survived. If she died, then he would truly have nothing to live for. But the most disgusting thing about Roswell is how even as he cradles Rom's motionless body, literally dying in his arms, all What shall I do to Echidna, right? What should I do? Give me your guidance again. He can think about is the gospel. Is Echidna best girl? The more I get to learn about Echidna, the more I realize that she is just the root of all evil right now. What do I mean by that? It means that Ram was groomed by Roswell, but Roswell was groomed by Echidna. Echidna just seems to be just heinous witch, and she is, that just does all this crazy shit as long as it satisfies her thirst for knowledge. The more I get to learn about her, the more I realize... I mean, what the fuck did you expect? She's a witch, right? All the witches are fucking terrible pretty much, I, I think. But, is she really best girl? I don't know. His yellow eye starts throbbing. That's a, that's a lot of tea. That, that is a lot of tea, bro. The yellow eye twitching, I think, um, um, kind of like symbolizes Hector and how like 
Puck says, no matter how much you try, you will never be like the devil or something. Yellow Eye starts throbbing. In the light novel, he notes that if it continues, he'll stop being himself. That's interesting. So again, the yellow eye and the connection with Hector or something. He'll stop being himself as in he'll return to what he truly is because himself is some sort of being along with Hector. He's trying to be like Hector. Which pretty much confirms that Hector is in there somewhere. We also learned how Roswell survived for 400 years as a mere human. Some of Echidna's forbidden Possession. knowledge was her method of transferring souls, which Roswell uses to possess his descendants. Yep. So for the past 400 years... I wonder how that works. Because like... He fucks a ba- Whoa! He reproduces with the other gender and creates a baby. And then that baby has to have no soul because Roswell needs to implant that soul into the baby, right? Like, how does that work? Roswell has been forcefully shoving his soul into the body of his children without their consent. Yeah, and what does, like, the wife think? What does the mother think? And how does it always look so much like Roswell? Every baby just looks like Roswell again. Sounds very illegal, and yes, for those of you... Yes, there was a girl version. Roswell eventually, he took back shots at a certain time. Wondering, Roswell did sometimes live as a woman. Just for fun. He's like, I, I'm tired of being a man. I'm gonna be a woman for once and take some back shots. Puck also tells Roswell that no matter what, he's still a human who will never be like Hector. Yep. But if Puck knew about Hector, why didn't he warn us about Roswell in season one? Well, in Frozen Bonds, we learn the terms of Puck's original Excessive interference is bad. Contract with the person that created him, which included his Echidna, memories being erased right? if he got too close to Amelia. So this whole time we've known Puck, he hasn't had his memories. However, now that his contract with Amelia is broken, Puck might have his memories back and- Really? See, so I guess my interpretation of what happened in the beginning of Frozen Bond is wrong. Because I thought that Puck lost his memories pre-Frozen Bond. No, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought that when Amelia, uh, like, like, I don't know exactly when Puck and Amelia met. It sounds, it seems like they really just met in the beginning of Frozen Bond, unless Puck is Amelia's dad somehow. I don't know. I thought that he lost his memories, and in the beginning of Frozen Bond, he finally got those memories back, and that's why he was like, I finally found you. I thought that was some sort of implication that he had lost his memories to excessive interference with Amelia in the past, and now he's gotten them back, and he found Amelia in Elio Force, but no. Seemingly not. Now it's just like, the memories are truly returning now. Puck is even more mysterious because up until this point, he doesn't know shit. And now, he's getting it all back. Now that his contract with Amelia is broken, Puck might have his memories back and might also have many of the answers we've all been searching for. Yeah, and you know we're not going to get any of those answers. There's no fucking way we're getting any answers like that in a show like ReZero. But the one thing he doesn't have... Especially from a character like fucking Puck, where he's just a deadbeat. Exactly, look at the milk aisle right now. ...is milk. So yet again, he disappears faster than Regulus could say... <laughs> Bye. What was that? Thank you! He's mentioning it! Thank you, Echidna is mentioning how Echidna voice actor slipped in through Shima at this point. Why? Maya Sakamoto voicing Ryuzu Shima. What could that possibly mean? Is it just hinting that, you know, because these Ryuzus are failed immortality experimentations that a fragment of Echidna's soul leaked out there? What is that? Well, here's my theory. Ryuzu's voice actor caught the Rona, so Echidna's voice actor had to step in to cover for her. Sure, but if she would do that, wouldn't, don't you think that she would try to sound like Ryuzu rather than sounding like Echidna? If it's truly a casting issue because someone got sick, don't you think Echidna's voice actor would like change her pitch to sound like Ryuzu rather than Echidna? Omega Lord. In the past two episodes, both of the Gospels Echidna left behind have burnt to ashes. Yeah. With them I know he's joking. I'm just also joking with that logic. But it's just like, alright, we're not gonna talk about it. Just, just weird. Maybe one theory is, again, it's a failed immortality experimentation. And Echidna realized that maybe compressing her soul because there, her, there's too many terabytes, right? Enough data to compress into Ryuzu. But maybe, there's like... A fragment of Echidna's soul in there. And Echidna is with us in spirit through these Ryuzus. 
I don't know. Her legacy was destroyed. The reason that's a big deal is because Echidna's Gospels were responsible for 99% of the conflict this season. So the entire time, Subaru was indirectly battling against Echidna. In the mm -hmm. web novel, Season 2 is titled The Eternal Contract, referring to Beatrice. Breaking that contract this episode solidified Echidna's defeat. So is there any punishment that comes with breaking a contract? I have no clue. Subaru won, and his prize was an adorable new contract spirit. That's right, we are literally a spirit art user now. Just like Amelia was. I don't know if Amelia still counts as a spirit art user because the contract with Pucky's gone, but Amelia still kind of like chills with the lesser spirits. But Subaru, he is a lolly monster. That's right, don't forget about Mady. Mady is also joining. Reinhardt has competition. Reinhardt's jealous of us. Spirit. This is something that's been foreshadowed since the very first episode of- That's right, Subaru is so compatible. His affinity for spirits is immense, right? Jul uh, Julius also mentions that at the uh, near the end of season one. Season one, and that shows how well planned. And All right, your first message is a YouTube link. I'm going to click the link, and if it makes me laugh, I won't ban you. But if it doesn't, I will perma ban you. Here we go. Out out right now. I don't care. I'll be back soon. I am going to execute his emo ass one. That is the most unfunniest Persona 3 abridged. Like, you thought that was funny. You thought, like, during the ReZero reaction, like, you wanted your comment to be heard. So, like, just as you wanted the attention, I'll give you the attention right now, Techhead. That was so fucking cringe. What a terrible fucking video. You have no social awareness, and that's probably why you're so lonely and depressed that you're watching me right now and sending a link to try to get my attention, but I'm not your friend, and I'm going to permanently ban you. Goodbye. Holy shit, what an idiot. Alright, back to the content! coherent the ReZero story is. Beatrice and Subaru have the same affinity for shadow magic, making yeah. them a perfect match. Both the spirits match, like, elements too, right? I mean... Puck and Amelia, they do, I guess. But, like, this too. Like, Shadow Magic. Can you... And, like, the interesting thing is how our gate is broken. And I know that the difference between magic and spirit art is that magic users uses their own source of mana internally and then pushes it throughout their gate to use magic. Spirit art, you don't have to be internal source of mana. You can get it externally. But what about that gate? Even if it's broken, maybe it doesn't matter. Match, and looking back now, it was very obvious that they were meant for each other. But let me clarify, because I know- What about this, though? <laughs> like, we're literally holding hands, we made a contract. But what about Amelia? I love, I love you, Amelia. And then you return with Biko. Is Amelia going to be fine with this shit? But let me clarify, because I know some of you are going to take it the wrong way. Subaru loves Beatrice, yeah. but it isn't romantic love. Super okay, it's not romantic. Does Biko know that, though? Right? What about Biko? What, what is her love to Subaru? Subaru loves Beatrice like a little sister. Okay. Not the kind that writes light novels. Sure. For the remainder of ReZero, Beatrice- But what about Biko to Subaru? Beatrice will accompany Subaru hand in hand throughout the rest of his journey. And that makes me extremely happy. I'm also happy that Crunchyroll didn't pick the wrong subtitles. This was one of the best scenes in ReZero. You think that Biko has no affection for Subaru romantically then after all of this? She doesn't have to. I don't think there is any, but... Last, at the end, she's like, Subaru, 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 yeah! She's just spamming his name. It, it feels like she just changed, right? She's no longer Sundere. She's like just all dead dead now. Is it going to be a one-sided love, or how's that going to develop? Zero, and I respect how detailed it was. For example, the gospel being covered in tears because it was the source of the tears. And the burn marks on Subaru's hands that showed us viewers and Beatrice that he was willing to suffer for her. Mm -hmm. But nothing made me happier than when she dropped that gospel like it was a banned Dr. Seuss book. Their exit from the burning mansion was beautiful, and in my opinion, the highlight of the episode was Frederica's outfit. Yeah, why does, like, how come Garfield's pants are still intact? But, like, like... 
I guess his pants are super stretchy because Frederica, all her, and Garfield gets even bigger than Frederica, but Frederica clothes all gets ripped up, but Garfield's is perfectly fine. He should also be wrapped up with a towel here. And Mady, man, what are we going to do with Mady? I think that Mady will also, yeah, literally Hulk pants, right? <laughs> like, the Hulk pants are more durable than Captain America's fucking shield. Frederica's outfit was when Beatrice said Subaru's name. Subaru 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 and now we're gonna subjugate the Great Rabbit together? Giga Chads, that entrance was stunning, as was the entire episode. This episode was a 10, 10 out, of 10. out of 10. I was so impressed, I had to log onto my- 8.63? That's pretty rough. I think that re-zero is minimum of 9. 9 point something. Smurf mal account just to give this episode a 10 twice. But as for next week's episode, I want to warn everyone not to skip the ending because I think there might be an after credit scene. My okay. favorite moment in the entire web novel is supposed to be adapted next week. And in my okay. opinion, it would fit well as an after credit scene. So if that's the case, I want to make sure you guys don't miss it by accident. And speaking of accidents, if you accidentally... Yes, sir. Please go like Mr. Egg Kid Nuts video. Check out his channel if you haven't. And we're reaching the end, man. There's a couple. And oh, it's, there's not a couple. There's a lot of fucking ReZero content to farm. Listen, you think that we're finishing off ReZero as we end the season two? There is a fucking backlog of videos that we haven't intentionally watched because of potential spoilers and simply because algorithm is going to do another boost in about another like two weeks and it's the perfect opportune time to farm those videos so don't worry all those if routes as long as they don't spoil me of the anime content uh, we will be covering and, and more on but that's it check out his channel i'll see you next time